say impossible. Right, because there's you only so many probabilities. Theoretically, you have two different messages that compute to the same hash. That is possible. You can show that mathematically. Now try and do that. <laughs> That's a whole different thing entirely. Right. And therefore, it's also infeasible to get two originals with the same hash. It, it, it is theoretically possible, um, but not likely at this point. Now, infeasible means, we're, first of all, we're talking about current technology and reasonably forecast. So if you take a look at hashing algorithms and things like that, um, and this is all related as well to encryption and similar technologies, what you will generally find is this particular standard has been estimated to be secure until the year 2030, based on where we think technology is going. NIST is the one who generally makes those kinds of statements. Okay. Um, IST? NIST, oh. National Institute, Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, so, basically, what we're saying, when we say infeasible, we're saying we can mathematically analyze the level of resources necessary to crack all of this stuff. And say, yeah, ain't going to happen. But it is an arms race. NSA, GCHQ, and criminals, <laughs> can be hard to tell the difference are all eager to break encryption. Mm -hmm. what, what do you say GCHQ is? Uh, that's Britain. Uh, oh. Alright, Britain. General Communications Headquarters, I think is what that stands for. But it's, it's the British equivalent of NSA. Um, researchers are always researching. Um, and that's why I subscribe to a bunch of security blogs and you know, keep up with the current state of the industry here. Uh, one of the things you may hear, quantum computing. Okay. Oh, that's going to change everything, you know. With a quantum computer, you know, they can crack any password in 37 seconds. All right. they can write the software. Mm. Yeah. Um, so. We're talking about an infinitely fast computer chip. Well, the, the idea of quantum computing is uh, it's like infinitely fast, but really what it is is instead of zeros and ones, um, a, a quantum bit, a qubit, uh, exists in a number of states simultaneously and can use all of those states in simultaneous calculations. So yes, it does speed things up immensely. Now, hashing algorithms first one in major use, MD5, created by Ron Rivest, and that's the R in RSA. Remember, RSA is Rivest, uh, Shamir, Edelman, the three people who created it. MD5 created in 91, no longer secure. This is one of those things that happens with algorithms, is they, they work for a while, and then the technology catches up, and it's like, okay, we figured out how to practice still, stuff. And they're still providing MD5 keys along with uh, ISO downloads. And that's fine, because we're not trying to provide security. What we're trying to do... Verify. We're just trying to verify. Remember the thing with the hashing algorithm? <coughs> if you change one bit in the original file, you will get a completely different hash. And so that's all we're trying to do, is say, there has not been a single bit changed in the file. We're verifying the authenticity of the file. We're not trying to secure things against attack. So MD5 with ISOs is fine. That's perfectly valid use. Uh, next one was the secure hashing algorithm number one, or SHA-1, um, created by NSA. And it was required for a long time in, in many government applications. Uh, but by around 2005, they were starting to find weaknesses in it. So that led to SHA-2. Mm -hmm. um, and SHA-2 is probably the best you're going to find right now. There was a competition in, that ended early in 2014 to create SHA-3. Uh, Bruce Schneier was one of the competitors. Uh, it turns out his algorithm was not the one chosen, but he was uh, 
very good about it and wrote a post saying, well, it was a fair competition and, you know, the one they picked was perfectly good. <laughs> um, but because it's very new, it's not in widespread use. So you're not going to find SHA-3. You, you hope you're going to find SHA-2. Mm -hmm. Now, we're talking about the version of the algorithm when we say SHA-1 or SHA-2. You might see things like SHA-256. And that, what that means is not the version of the algorithm, it's the, the bit length of the key. Isn't SHA-1, 128, and 2, 256, though, or...? Uh, SHA-2, there's a number. The 256 is common, um, but you can have more. You can have 512. So, responsible owner, if you are taking passwords and storing them in a database, use encryption, definitely not MD5. <laughs> Hopefully not SHA-1 anymore. Ideally, SHA-2. <coughs> now, SHA-1 has been used for a while now in SSL certificates. Mm -hmm. um, Not anymore. Well, they're scheduled for end of life. Google is pushing to do it right away. Microsoft right. said we're going to remove uh, support for it in 2017. Um, I think Chrome already does. Mark them. What they're doing at this point is if you have a certificate that is uh, authenticated with a SHA-1 key um, that extends into 2017, or is it into 2016? Uh, I don't remember now which one it was. But uh, what it will do is it will throw up a message saying, that, you know, we cannot guarantee that this site is secure. Right. So to warn you when to go there, I, you can still go there. Right. But it'll just give you a warning. Um, Google's gotten a certain amount of criticism for being a little too eager on that. Um, everyone in the industry thought Microsoft had it about right. Um, wow. <laughs> well, you know, the whole thing about certs, if you want, you know, I could do a presentation on SSL certs at some point. That's an interesting topic in itself. Well, I'd like to see that. Yeah. Um, but basically, uh, they're expensive. You know, it's like a thousand dollars for two years. So, now, in practice, your password, generally speaking, is transmitted to the site in the clear, which means you are vulnerable to a man-in-the-middle attack, unless you've connected via SSL. Mm -hmm. Now, browsers are starting to be configured to make SSL the default. Um, EFF created a plugin. Uh, this is available for, I think, all of the major browsers that basically forces, it forces you to request an SSL connection. It's up to the site whether or not they honor that. Now, my site, which I showed you earlier, is wilnick.com. I don't have an SSL certificate. I'm not doing e-commerce. Mm -hmm. I'm just putting up articles. <laughs> they and want to be public, so... <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it's, not that I, it's not that I'm opposed to it in principle. It's just, I don't have $1,000 to spend to throw a cert up for no good reason. And I have to do it again in two years. Search in a thousand. Well, okay. Do we have any other Ubuntu users here? Okay. Where did Mark Shuttleworth get all his money? Selling SSL certificates. A company called Thought, T H A W T E. He founded it, sold it for a pile of money to Verisign. So. The money behind Ubuntu came from selling SSL certs. It is very lucrative. Um, I know, I know. We purchased a global cert for a couple of years, and it seems like it was like five hundred for a global. So, like, actually, wild very, card, I should say. Very interesting topic, and I'll, I'd like to take you up on your offer to okay. do a presentation sometime. Sure. Yeah. 
Um, hashing is generally done on the site, and the hash is what is stored. Um, and then on later logins, when you go there, you enter your password, they hash the password using the same algorithm, compare it to what's in the database. Mm -hmm. If they match, you're in. Um, done properly, that should be perfectly secure. Now, properly implies several things, that the, you're using a, a secure hashing algorithm, that the password has the right characteristics, blah, blah, blah. But this is, as Bruce Schneier says, trust the math. Now, dictionary attacks. This is how most attacks are done. A large number of passwords are created and the hash created. You know, hashing algorithms are public information. There's nothing secret about hashing algorithms. We, we talked about them, they are standards. Um, so anyone can use them. So what you do is you, you get a, spend a little bit of time on a computer and you create a database of hashed passwords. So that's your dictionary and then when you get to a site and you get a hold of their database and copy that down, uh, then you can do it just to compare between your dictionary database and the one you got from this site. Now, we have found through experience at least 50% of the passwords in any downloaded database can be found fairly quickly just by doing this dictionary attack. Without any modification at all? Right. So there's a real common word that people use, password, for example. A lot of people are using that, so it hashes to a certain set of bytes. Right. See, most sites now won't take just letters, so... Yeah, right, right. And, uh, yeah, uh, because this sort of thing... Well, happens. I'm sure things like password 01... Is well, actually, easy. capital P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D-1 is probably the most common for Microsoft servers. Uh-huh. <laughs> so... A lot of people use known poor passwords, and here uh, there are lists of these things put out periodically. Here are some of the most common. These are like in your top 20 list of passwords. Um, now, for a while, leet speak, you know, that's where you substitute a number for a letter, so a 3 instead of an E, a 0 instead of an O, that sort of thing. That does, that's all part of the dictionary now. So they've, they've long ago figured that out. And since many people will use the same bad password, in that database, when we said 50% of them, you know, fail all at once, a lot of them are, everyone using password is their password. You know, you get a whole bunch of those. So the solution to that is something called a salted hash. And that is a random number is added to the password before it is hashed. And that's called the salt. Now, understanding how this works, Brian has created a password on my site. And I assign him the random number 161803 actually isn't a random number. It's I'm glad I don't ratio. need to know the salt. <laughs> but what I have to do is I have to store in the dictionary, I have to store in my database something that says, well, this is Brian, and this is his salt. I have to store that number, mm -hmm. and then here's the resulting hash. So if someone gets the database, they get the salt. So why does this work? Because the cracker doesn't know what your password is. So they would have to recompile their entire dictionary with that one number right. just to see if they can get your password. And then they have to repeat that again for every other password in there. So what it is is it just it becomes computationally infeasible. Because remember, these people are not generally looking to just score one password. They're looking to score a million. All right? So salted hash will, in fact, defeat that because it takes 
a certain amount of computing time to build that database, that dictionary. That so they're use. how do they know the specific salt applies to a specific individual? It has that to be in the database. Okay, so there's something in a database, but there has to username. be a username. Yeah. Okay, so there has to be something that says this username uses this salt. Yes. Right. Okay, so if they get that information also, then it defeats the salt. No. Right? No. Because now they got to do the dictionary for the attack with the salt in it per user. Remember, this, the, the hash has two components to it now. All there right. is the okay. password and then the salt. I mean, unless knowing the salt is interesting, but we don't know what the password is. And so that dictionary attack, where we get this huge dictionary of pre-computed hashes, we have to do a whole new version of that dictionary of pre-computed hashes using just this one salt. Okay, so but there would be, okay, so let me just jump one step further. So there are passwords, like password, which right. are common enough that if they did that once for all a whole long list of numbers, all the numbers from zero to 90,000, right? Salt okay. doesn't have to be numeric. Then they, then they would, well, yeah. It, binary. Everything is numeric. Zeros and ones. So, right. Um, okay, so I'm just saying, it's, it is, you're right, it's computationally right. difficult, but if you still are using a bad password, so, it's still less secure. So let's say it takes you um, a day to compile a dictionary. I could compile a dictionary using this one salt and maybe get Brian's password for a day's work. Right. Now, the next person in the database, I've got a completely different salt. I've now got to spend a day recompiling that dictionary and maybe get that person's password. Well, I understand that concept. If right. Brian is a real good Brian, and Brian does a password that has a number of characteristics that would make it unlikely other people are using that same password. Right. But if there is an, a bad Brian out there in this, right. you know, and My bad Brian, just just other bad people, Brian. If, if he was using password as his password, yes. <laughs> Then he and all the people who then use that the method. resulting hash is password plus his salt. The other person who used password has a different salt. Yes, I understand it. So the one computation it takes to take that one number with the word password mm -hmm. would be one of 90,000 likely numbers or, or right. combinations. But then that one day they spend doing all those hashes, right, get some most of the users that are using the password as no, you're, you're, you're not getting what I'm saying. It, it, will, it might take a day to do a table of all of the possible passwords with just that one salt. Yes. So you're not going to get 90,000 different ones in one day. It's going to take you 90,000 days. Okay, so I, I might have this flipped around. So yeah. if you have the word password as your password. Right and you run it against all the known salts you can come up with, 90,000 of them. And it takes you a full day to do that, right? Oh, I see what you're saying. So every single person who has then, any salt in that table... Okay, any a password that bad, yeah, you might be able to do that. So uh, it's still, use a good password is still a worthwhile thing to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it isn't. But um, this doesn't solve the problem of the people who are using really poor passwords, necessarily. You can't solve all problems. Um, understand the salt has to be stored because otherwise we wouldn't know how to let you in the next time. Right. You well, know? you understand that there's got to be somebody out there, some cracker groups or whatever, that are going against all the known salts they can come up with, with mm -hmm. all the common passwords. So they're no yeah. longer going to have to do this one-day computation. That's probably already been done. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to see, uh, here's a, a place that explains salting hashes and how to do that, if, if you're interested. So, that was the site owners. So, Gib, if I were doing this for your library patrons and we said, you know, there should, there should be a break, this is about the point where I would say, you know, take a five minute break.
Because now we're about to get into. Okay, well, let's let's do that. Let's take a five-minute break.